Hello, everyone, and welcome to Slash Home Daily for Monday, November 26, 2018. On today's episode, we're going to talk about what we've been up to at the water cooler. This is Slash Home Editor-in-Chief Peter Soretta, and joining me on today's podcast is Slash Home Managing Editor Jacob Hall. Hello, hello. Weekend Editor Brad Oman. Hey, that's me. Senior Writer Ben Pearson. Hey, what's going on? And Writer Swai Tran Bui. Hey, everyone. And Chris Evangelista. Hello. Okay, I think this is the first and probably last time that we'll ever do this, but this is the we are having back to back water cooler episodes because the last time we recorded was on Wednesday before Thanksgiving and today's Monday. So in your feed you're gonna get two water cooler episodes in a row. I hope I hope that someone isn't finding the podcast for the first time uh in one of these episodes. But uh but we we should get to it. Uh I'm sure we all had Thanksgiving celebrations. We'll we'll talk about that later. Uh, let's talk about uh, let's start things off with what we've been doing. Um, I bought uh, my girlfriend Kitra. It's her birthday in uh, a couple weeks. I bought her a fancy Breville Barista espresso machine. And uh, you're probably wondering why is she saying this on a podcast when her birthday is weeks? Uh, you know, weeks from now. Uh, I ordered this on a very good deal through Amazon, and um, I even, you know, it was like, this will ship with uh, packaging that says what the product is unless you mark this box, and we'll put it in that box inside of Am- in an Amazon box. And I checked that box, and even though I checked that box, uh, Kitra went to get the mail, <laughs> and, it, and it was it was in packaging that basically said exactly what it was. So, uh, so birthday surprise ruined. Um, but, um, so we spent, uh, do, do any of you guys have an espresso machine? No, no. Um, my girlfriend is a huge coffee drinker. She loves coffee and she's had a Nespresso machine with, with like those pod things. Um, and this is the first time like her actually getting like a real espresso machine. And I'm not a coffee drinker, but uh, this thing's complicated, you guys. Like it, it, like you need to like, you know, it, it's one of those machines you put beans in and it like grinds the beans. And then, it, But there's like all sorts of settings of like how fine you want the beans and how, you know, you got to get the pressure just right. And I think we spent like a day trying to like even figure out the settings for this thing. And it's, I almost feel like in some of these kind of worlds, like people get enjoyment out of like that kind of like tinkering of getting getting it right but it's kind of frustrating it's almost i almost wish like you know there was a resource out there for like you know if you're using you know these beans from stump town you know use these settings on your espresso maker but there isn't because i guess apparently water makes a huge difference as well so anyways uh i know this is probably not interesting to the majority of you but uh we've been uh, you know we've probably made more cups of uh, espresso over the last couple of days than uh, most people have any uh ha- drink in a year uh tr- trying to get these settings down and uh but uh, uh she 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 loves it so uh that that is good um i uh yeah th- th- i'll talk about thanksgiving and what we've been eating but i did have a friend's giving over and we'll talk about that later uh jacob what have you been up to i've been driving back and forth across the state of texas to attend two thanksgivings uh first my family's in san antonio so i drove from uh austin san antonio and a few days later from san antonio back to austin so i could drop off some things and then spend a night at home in my own bed. Then I had to drive over the Dallas to my wife's family and from Dallas back to San Antonio. So it's just been all lots of cars, lots of Texas highways, lots of not having a relaxing vacation in any way whatsoever. But I get to see pretty much everybody, my both sides of my family, that I care to see. I get to play lots of games. We'll talk about that later on. I get to not see a lot of movies, which I'll talk about later on. I did, however, um, when I was in Dallas, I got to visit... Uh, Madness Comics and Games in Plano, Texas, which is a suburb of, da- suburb of Dallas. And I think I mentioned this store before on the show. When I first went there about a year ago. Uh, and since I was last there, they've done a rearranging. And it's one of the uh, – like rearranging and restocking. And it's one of the best comic and game stores I've ever been in. They're having a buy two, get one free store-wide sale. So literally my wife said, hey, if you want to take a big chunk of money – and your Christmas gift from me is you to go on a shopping spree at this at this game store and buy whatever the hell you want for a couple of hours. And I said, yes, please. So my Christmas is over already. Uh, but I bought so much stuff, Peter, uh, can, games, comics, can, can, RPGs. Can I, so. can I ask you what you bought? 
the big the big thing about um um uh, Betrayal Legacy, the new um legacy game from um designer Rob, Rob Davio. If those of you don't know this type of board game, it's a um design style where you build the game as you go, you mark the board, you tear up cards, you put stickers on things, and you change the rules and fundamentally alter the game so that as you play and keep on playing, the game will evolve to how you have impacted it. And this is a uh, legacy version of Betrayal at House in the Hill, which is a haunted house game where uh, players work together to explore a haunted house, and eventually one player has to try to kill everybody else. They revealed as a murderer, or they get a controlled army of ghosts, or do something to try to kill everybody else. But the gist here is the game begins in the 1770s, and each time you play, it's 30 years later. And people, people died in previous games, become ghosts to haunt the house. Um, things that happened in previous games in terms of um, crazy escapes or um, crazy things that happened linger in the house. So every time you play, it's 30 years later, a new era, new characters, a new like stuff's happening, new themes, all the way up through uh, 2016. So it seems really, really cool. I'm excited to dig into that. Also, I got some... Um, Let's see, I got uh, Injection, if you've ever read that, it's a great comic book series, I have a new hardcover, I have a big stack of other, other comics as well, I got Railroad Inc., which is a the, the new hot small box board game people are talking about this season, I'm very excited to dig into that, and I picked up Sagrada, it's a game I've played before, which is a game of making stained glass windows, which sounds boring, but it is not, it is incredibly engaging, incredibly fun, and plays in 30 minutes, and that's just off the top of my head, I, I, I spent way too much money, Peter, uh, but... <laughs> Madness Comics and Games, if you're in the Dallas area, I mean, I'm I'm spoiled with good comic and game stores in Austin, but they give Austin a run for its money when it comes to, like, genuinely friendly, well-laid-out, well-stocked experiences. Um, and, and I know you mentioned this in our, our uh, Slash Film Slack channel, but the the graphic novel for Saga, the the hardcover book, is on sale today. So if, if people are listening to this, do you know how much that is? How much is uh, it's it's normally fifty dollars if you're a Prime member. Last time I checked, it was uh, down to twenty three as part of their um, part of their sale today, and it is the best comic series of the past decade. Getting the first eighteen issues in a beautiful hardcover for twenty three dollars, and I cannot recommend it more highly. Yeah, me, me as well. Uh, okay, Brad, what have you been up to? Uh, well, as I said last week, I am in Utah visiting my girlfriend for a couple weeks. So this is actually the first Thanksgiving that I spent uh, away from my family. And um, I this is the first year that I also didn't have turkey for Thanksgiving because uh, my girlfriend's family usually likes to mix things up on Thanksgiving. They don't always have turkey. They, they do sometimes, but oftentimes they just like make a nice meal with a lot of different sides. Um, so we had some uh, some uh, great uh, steak this year and we had but we did throw in some usual traditional food in there like green bean casserole and whatnot. And so it was um, you know it was a, a new experience, but it was, uh, very satisfying. The food was delicious. My girlfriend's uh, quite the good cook, um, as are some of her siblings. So we, we just had a, a, a quiet little uh, Thanksgiving since some of her family wasn't around. Um, one thing that did make it exciting is that we've been uh, – do- we dog sat for a few days for one of her cousins. Um, weirdly enough, we were kind of second-hand dog sitting because her cousin was dog sitting for another friend of theirs – who apparently got engaged and was originally only supposed to be gone for a few days, but has been gone for a couple of weeks and they were going away for Thanksgiving and they needed someone else to take the dog. So we, we had this uh, cute little French bulldog for a few days named Heidi. Um, and she was really adorable and fun, but my girlfriend's sister's daughter, uh, who is around four or five was absolutely terrified of this cute little <laughs> French bulldog. As soon as the dog came in and we let her out, she was like ran away and was screaming. She's like, Oh my God, she's going to bite me. She's going to bite me. <laughs> and it was, we we tried to like get her to be brave and come near it. And then like, she would do a complete 180 when we would put her in her kennel for a little bit. And she would go up to the kennel and be like, Oh, what a cute little puppy. <laughs> <laughs> And French so that, bulldogs will like typically get in your face. They want to like kiss, like, you know, they jump and try to kiss you and stuff. Like they're not, you know, they don't hold back. Well, this one actually, she was pretty. Okay. She, she like w- once you let her out of her cage, she ran around a good amount and she was a little bit hyper. But then she would just chill and like sit next to you and lay down. And so it, um, it wasn't too too bad. But and thankfully, um, her my my girlfriend's sister's other daughter was a little bit more calm about it and like to to pet the dog and that kind of thing but that was that made for quite an entertaining day um and we did a little bit of black friday shopping after that just went out and hit some stores and tried to find some stuff i didn't really have much luck 
getting any of the cheap movies that I want to try and get my hands on this year. It seems like shoppers were a little more rabid than they normally are. Uh, but I did find a cool new Harry Potter ornament for my Christmas tree. Um, at Walmart, they had this special, there was like a, an actual shiny golden snitch ornament that I picked up uh, from their ornament section in the uh, seasonal department. So that was pretty cool. Yeah, I also went Black Friday shopping and didn't really buy anything. Like, I, I don't know, I went and I was like, you know, I'll end up buying something that's on sale that I didn't think I needed because, because the price is just too good to pass up. But it, it, I feel like now it's like if you don't want physical media or you don't want a new TV or you don't need like a, the, you know, like an air fryer, then there, there really isn't uh, a lot for you on Black Friday these days. Yeah, unless unless you're shopping online, yeah, there's a pretty lot of stuff. Yeah, I I did buy a ring doorbell online. Yeah, that's the the one thing. And I uh, um, I also went to uh, Target because if you bought anything at Target, you would get a coupon for this week for twenty percent off your entire purchase. So I did that as well, um, but uh, not very interesting. Um, the, in that snitch ornament is from Walmart. You said. It is, yeah. I found it there in their um, in their ornament section. Normally, the Walmart ornaments that they have from Hallmark are the cheaper plastic ones that aren't as high quality as the Hallmark keepsake ornaments. But this one is a, very, a really nice one that's that's a little bit more expensive than those. So I, I think that they have like a new tier of ornaments that are a little bit more higher quality um, than the the usual cheap ones that they have at Walmart. Speaking of ornaments, I know you mentioned this last year because you started getting invested in this Hallmark Star Wars series where the ornaments all connect together and like kind of, uh, you know, they, with lights and sound share a scene, scenes from the movie. Um, yeah, they've been adding, you know, they added another one this year. What was the Millennium Falcon? I think. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I got that and already like, you know, we're only in the second year of these ornaments. And when you press the button on these things on my Christmas tree, I kid you not, it probably goes on for like five minutes. It's it like, I, I think by the time they come out with all these ornaments, it'll be like the whole movie. Like you're just watching your tree and the whole movie goes by. Like there's going to be like scenes on the t- t- tree. It's it's insane. It's almost, ob- it's almost obnoxious. No, it is obnoxious. At this point, it's obnoxious and we're only in the second year. I can't imagine, you know, adding more things to the mix and how long uh, that series, you know, that whole string of uh, ornaments is, is going to go. Soon we're going to be watching movies on our Christmas trees. Yes. Um, well, Hallmark has to make their money somehow. So, uh, Ben, what have you been up to? I uh, went to a Friendsgiving hosted by you, which I think you'll probably talk about a little bit later on. Uh, the day after Thanksgiving, my wife and I celebrated what we are calling the first annual Vince Garal Day. Uh, that is based <laughs> on Vince Garaldi Trio, the uh, jazz band that provided the... Uh, soundtrack for a Charlie Brown Christmas that is like the the one album that is like the Christmas album that we never get tired of and it's really like I think we probably talked about it last year as well it's like the defining sound of the season album for us so we have held out on playing any of that music and uh and dubbed the day after Thanksgiving Vince Garal Day as the day where we finally just put that album on repeat all day and we went out and got our Christmas tree and decorated that and sort of uh you know just like switched out all the the decorations in our apartment and stuff like that for uh for Christmas so that was a, a cool fun thing um so if anybody out there feels like celebrating Vince Garal Day feel free to uh, to do that <laughs> as well um and then my sister came in town uh, I'm going to see her when I go back to uh, visit my family in Florida uh, next month, but she and her husband are out in California. They're going to Disneyland and and they just uh, went from, they, they were in San Francisco and they stopped in LA on their way to Anaheim. And uh, so I met up with them with my wife and we all went out to eat yesterday and I took her to the last bookstore for the first time. And I've talked about that before, but it's a really cool place. If you're ever in LA and you're a big reader um, or just like the idea of wandering through uh, a really cool 
bookstore, I would definitely recommend going to check that place out. It's in downtown LA. It's really great. Uh, and then also I finally, uh, stepped into the future by signing up for Amazon prime and Amazon fresh. My wife and I really don't like going to the grocery store in, <laughs> in Los Angeles. It's such a pain in the ass every week and we sort of dread it. So we finally just got fed up with the idea of having to go. So we looked into it and just pulled the trigger on Amazon Fresh and had people deliver our groceries to us. And it was kind of a, an amazing experience of just like saving the time and effort of actually, you know, huffing <laughs> it out to uh, to freaking Ralph's or whatever and, and getting groceries. So uh, I'm, I'm do any of you uh, subscribe to Amazon Fresh? Do any of you have your groceries delivered to you? Uh, I, I have it. Yeah, not I don't use it all the time. But yeah, we do have it. So what do you think about it? Uh, it's good so far. I mean, the, the options are a little limited, but for, you know, when I'm feeling lazy, and I don't feel like going to the market. It, it's a great thing to have because you can pick, you know, what time it drops off and you can also select, uh, like, uh, de- you know, you can get it delivered without being there, which is my yeah. favorite thing. Cause I don't want to talk or see anyone. <laughs> Please leave me alone. So, <laughs> so, uh, yeah, I like it. Um, I, I like it now because when they first started, they gave you these really obnoxious totes that you had to return. And then they realized that was like not cost effective. So now everything comes in recyclable, recyclable paper bags, which is a lot easier. So I, I think it's worth it. Yeah, See, I sort of had similar issues where some of the stuff that we normally get every week weren't available. But I think, I don't know, I, I don't know. It, it's it's one of those things we're going to have to sort of feel it out to see if it's ultimately worth it. I'm, I'm technically just on the, like the free 30-day trial for Amazon Prime and Amazon Fresh right now. But based on the delivery yesterday, I think it's probably going to end up being something that we stick with. Especially since, obviously, like all the video stuff and the shows and everything that come with Amazon Prime uh, will have access to that too. But uh, what were you going to say, Peter? Yeah, I think Amazon... Amazon Prime is going to be a game changer for you. Uh, like you have so much that you you're going to be able to watch now uh, in terms of their original programming and and mm-hmm. just uh, their library of of streaming content. But uh, I did have Amazon Fresh, and I found the same thing that Chris found that the options were a little bit limited for stuff I wanted. Uh, so I'm just usually using Instacart, which I'm not sure if any of you use that or heard of it but it's kind of like uh you know it's it's the gig economy of like you know uber or whatever so you basically order what you want from you know one of your local grocery stores and someone actually goes and gets them and if they're out of a product you have like 15 minutes like you know they give you options for substitutions and it's pretty affordable so if if ben if you find Amazon Fresh is too limited. I would mm. recommend checking out Instacart, uh, which you know doesn't have the uh, the wonder of a uh, you know being a subscription service where you you uh, you know aren't paying for deliver you're paying for delivery, but it's it's not that bad. Uh, it's, it's, yeah, I'll look into that. Yeah. Um, Ht, what have you been up to? So I had my family Thanksgiving um, back in D.C., and I've talked about my big family, I think, before on this podcast. There's about 30-something people at this Thanksgiving, and in addition to that, there are about uh, five dogs and two babies, so it was quite crowded, but a lot of fun. Um, wait, wait a second. I, I need to get a picture of this. Like, how how does that work? Like, is there a kitchen table that accommodates all those people? Like, how? Oh, no. This is like a potluck style Thanksgiving every time. We don't have any room for tables. Like, well, we have we have one big table and then we have some, like, foldable tables. But most people, like the kids, a lot of those kids end up eating around, like, the coffee table at the TV or something. Like, we all kind of spread out around the house. Um some, often without chairs and or table. So, but it's fun every, every year. And it's kind of what happens when you have a big family like that. So you've already returned home after your big move. I know. I was only um, in New York for two weeks before I went back home for Thanksgiving. So, like, if the everyone is asking me about my move, and I was like, that doesn't really feel real yet because I was only there for two weeks. <laughs> but um, uh, when I was at home, though, my mom gave me an instant pot to take back to my apartment, which I'll talk about later, of course. <laughs> and um, while I was at home as well, I helped host my cousin's baby shower because there's another baby along the way. Um, and, uh, that was quite exciting. We kind of made up the house to look like a Pinterest worthy sort of like 
spread. There was like there were clouds and streamers everywhere. It was very tiring, but it was a lot. Of, it was also fun. <laughs> it was a lot of fun. I like my family, and like I know a lot of people don't, but I enjoyed spending time with them. And even though it's a bit chaotic, it's always fun. Um, speaking of my family, <laughs> when I came back to to New York, uh, I went to visit my cousin's restaurant, DND. It's a Vietnamese restaurant that just opened in Greenpoint in Brooklyn. Uh, well, it opened about sometime in April, and they're currently leading the Eater New York City Restaurant of the Year poll. By the way, uh, I linked it in oh, the wow. show notes. Um, and they're a great, they're a really great restaurant. Um, I went for the soft opening uh, back when they first were rolling out the opening in April or or March, and um, it was the food was good then, but it's, I think they've improved the flavors much what much better now. And I. I highly recommend if you go there to get the pho app jiao. It was, it's delicious. It's like pho noodles, but fried in kind of the Chinese uh, stir fry style, and it's really good. Uh, so that, that's really, that was really fun. And um, my my cousin actually is trying to woo me to work as a hostess at DND, which is which I thought was really funny. So maybe maybe I'll have that side hustle if uh, I need something else. <laughs> um let's move on to what we've been watching i'll talk about a, a few movies um which i think have already been talked about on this podcast um i'll start off with creed 2 i saw that last week i was a huge fan of creed 1 uh i agree with uh ben and chris that this movie is you know doesn't have the ryan coogler magic it like it, it, it. The writing is kind of a bit on the nose, uh, it, even though the concepts are so good. It, it's it's good. It's not a bad movie. I think I liked it the least out of uh, you two. Um, I I think um, I don't know. It, it's a good Rocky movie <laughs> on, on the grand scheme of things in this Rocky franchise, but it's not a great movie on you know the level of Rocky One and Creed One. And uh, watching it almost uh, made me wish that instead of doing Creed Two second, that they had done you know a film called like Drago with Ivan Drago and his son. Like I feel like that could have been a cool second film because they do some interesting things with those characters in this sequel, and they don't really get enough room there. Um, I and then you know followed that up with the third film Creed vs Drago. I think would have been uh, a, a cool you know cinematic universe uh, of films to do but uh we got what we got uh it's it's it, it, it's fine uh, if, if you like creed 2 a lot uh, i would recommend seeing it in theaters uh brad you also saw creed 2 i did yeah and um i i feel like i'm probably some um i, I liked it more than you did i think peter but i do agree with some of the criticisms that have already been made especially the man those points are not announcers were really annoying just like <laughs> saying so many things on the nose, explaining stuff that we don't need. Like you, you got to be selective if you're going to include sports announcers' voices in there. You, they don't. You don't need to include everything that they would have said if this were a real boxing match. Like we don't need to hear it. You, you, you can choose uh, which you know snippets to include as part of the movie. But um, you know, I, I think what really helps us is that Michael B. Jordan and Tessa Thompson are both fantastic in these roles, and I think seeing their dynamic continue and play out and how these characters uh, continue to grow is definitely the the better part of this movie, obviously all the boxing stuff makes it feel like a Rocky movie again, especially with the ties to Rocky four. Um, and I, I do like what they do with Ivan Drago as a character and his son, Victor too, because it helps humanize a character who was really just a cookie cutter villain, uh, in, in Rocky four. And it's, uh, I, I like how, you know, that, that plays out. And I don't, I don't, I don't really don't think we need a whole movie for that either. I think it works better as, as a side character, um, because we, we get an, enough of what's, what's happening there to, to know what's going on. But, um, yeah, I mean, w- without spoiling anything, I, I, I feel like this, it veers a little into being cliche, but it still has some incredible moments in it. The soundtrack is awesome. Uh, and yeah, it's, it's, it's really fun to see, especially if you like the first Creed. It's not quite as good as the first one, but it's, uh, it's, it's got a lot of good stuff in it. Yeah, it's definitely worth seeing. And I also saw Widows, which, uh, I'm not a big fan of Steve McQueen, uh, and, uh, I, I usually find his work, uh, overly pretentious, even though I love the craft of it. Like it's well shot. The cinematography is good. The acting's usually exceptional. Um, widows, uh, I was not expecting much because I know Ben 
last week kind of expressed his disappointment in this film. And I was kind of surprised by this. I, I, I do agree that the way this film is being marketed is completely false. It's being marketed as almost like an action heist movie, like an Ocean Eleven like style uh, film, where like you know it's mostly uh, character stuff. And I, I do also agree. I think uh, one of you, maybe Chris, said last week that uh, they spend almost too much time uh, giving you know side characters like uh, fleshing them out and showing their lives on screen. Um, but, uh, it, you know, it, it takes out an hour for, for the widows to actually get together. And for a movie that, like, is being marketed as, like, that's, you know, that's the hook of the movie. It's almost like you're spending the first hour, like, being like, we're the, we, the audience, are ahead of the characters on screen. And we know where this is headed. And come on, just get together already. Do you know what I mean? Like, it, it, you're kind of waiting for that. And I, I feel like that kind of hurts it. But that's, I, I think that's more to do with the, you know, how the movie was marketed and the advertising and less to do with the movie itself. Um, it, uh, I, you know, I, I don't like, the, there's kind of a twist in it. I don't really like that. I, I would have loved to see this story as like a season of TV. Um, but I did, I did, I don't know, the, the more I'm talking, it sounds like I did not like Widows, but I actually did enjoy it quite a bit, and I would Well, rec- you can go back and watch the, uh, the British TV series, because it's actually based on oh, a, is a it? show from the 1980s, yeah, some British TV show, I've never seen it, um, and it seems like it's, it's not super popular that, you know, people of our generation have seen it, but, uh, wow. I guess it was, it was like a big deal at the time, it ran for, I think, two seasons, so... Um, yeah, you could dive into that if you want to see that story told over, uh, over TV episodes instead. <laughs> it, it's funny. I, I, I did not even do the research on that because it almost feels like it wants to be a TV show, like a TV series, especially nowadays where, like, you know, you can have almost like a feature length film over the course of, like, you know, ten ep- eight, ten, eight or ten episodes. Um, and I can uh, also share my quick reaction to Aquaman because by the time this podcast is airing, uh, the social embargo for that has broken. I, I mentioned, uh, I think, last week that I had seen Aquaman. Uh, it is better than expected. Uh, it feels kind of like a phase one Marvel movie, and that's not an insult. That's, uh, you know, positive. Uh, it um, Black Manta is a great villain. I think comic book fans will, will really dig that. Uh, I, I, it's kind of... A shame that he plays second fiddle to the real antagonist. Um, there's uh, some truly spectacular one shots, and, and the action is just you know it's it's. I actually think the action in this movie, um, aside from like maybe one one sequence, uh, is some of the best superhero action that we've seen. Like James Wan is just incredible. Uh, the um, and it's one of those rare superhero films where the third act battle doesn't dissolve into. You know the typical comic book blahness. Um, it's uh, probably going too long in this. I'll get in trouble. But um, I, I, I do. I did like the movie. I'd recommend seeing it. Uh, it sounds. I did not see an IMAX. It sounds like the the movie is gonna be in mostly you know the, the IMAX ratio for the entire movie. So you should probably see it in th- it that way if you can. I do think that a lot of the the problems I have with this movie, which I'll talk about at a later point, uh, are decisions that one inherited from Zack Snyder. Uh, for instance, I don't think Amber Heard and uh, Jason Momoa have the chemistry of like a Gal Gadot and Chris Pine. Uh, you know, uh, it, it, it's in uh, he kind of uh, inherited those those choices from Zack Snyder. Uh, so there, there's a bunch of that. Um, yeah. So, yeah, that's my quick reaction to Aquaman. And uh, the reactions will be online today. So I'm sure you can uh, go online to SlashFilm.com while you're hearing this and see what other people think. So that's Aquaman, uh, which comes out in about a month. Uh, Chris, what have you been watching? Uh, so I didn't go to see any new films, uh, but I did catch up on some older things. So first off... Uh, I hadn't seen the the Jim Carrey Grinch since theaters, which was in 2000, which is, you know, 18 years ago. And uh, I don't remember loving it. I just remember seeing it and sort of just washing it from my memory. And since then, it's developed this sort of reputation as this god-awful movie. And I was curious. So I, I 
I did like an informal poll on Twitter, Twitter where I said, does anyone actually like the Grinch movie with Jim Carrey? And I got a lot of people saying they liked it, which surprised me. Um, they seem to be uh, younger viewers who saw it when they were younger. So, you know, they I guess they grew up with it. So I am one of those younger viewers who liked it. <laughs> I, I will say, I, like, I think I talked about this before. It's not a great movie, but it's an entertaining movie. And I do associate with my childhood, but it's Jim Carrey just going balls to the wall. And that's all you need sometimes in a Jim Carrey, the Grinch movie. See, yeah. So. <laughs> the only thing I remember about this movie is I remember being in the theater, seeing it opening night because I was a huge fan of Ron Howard. And I was, you know, I loved the Grinch. I remember like there was that moment where, uh, the young girl starts singing and I like wanted to leave. Like I was so <laughs> bored and I wanted to leave. And I, uh, you know, I go to universal studios in Hollywood all the time. They have this, they still have the set for that up on the studio tour. And it, it always like, I'm so aggravated that it's like still there. <laughs> but Yes. So yeah, my, my wife and I, we, we put up the Christmas tree and we, we wanted to get into the holiday spirit. So we had a few beers and I said, let's watch the Grinch because it's streaming on Netflix and I don't really remember if this is as bad as everyone says it is. So uh, <laughs> this this is quite a film. This film never stops for a second. It is it's an over caffeinated, uh, wacky, over the top uh, slice of mayhem. It's too long. It's too much. Jim Carrey, man, he he is going for it. He is not uh, sleeping. He's he's out of his goddamn mind. I don't know, like. How he, how he even like performed this film and didn't like check into a mental institution because he seems unhinged. Like he seems like he's literally out of his goddamn mind in this movie. And Ron Howard and the camera crew are just struggling to keep up with him. And the camera's just constantly bouncing around. And it's just a really weird movie, man. It's I don't I wouldn't call it awful. But it's so strange and it's so over the top. And there's this running subplot, which I completely forgot about, where Christine Baranski's character really wants to fuck the Grinch. Like, <laughs> no, no, no. Not, not only that, but in like her describing the flashback, she's getting like sexually flustered when she's thinking of the child Grinch lifting a huge Christmas tree. I remember that. <laughs> yeah, My she... favorite part of the movie is when I think the Grinch fly is like flies into the town at one point and like falls and his face falls straight into her breasts. I'm pretty yes. sure. Yeah. He lands right in her cleavage and she's fine with this because she's really horny for the group. <laughs> so I, I just watched this and I was like, man, this is so weird. Like, Cause this is a kid's movie, but it's very clear that Christine Baranski yeah wants to bed the Grinch. And so, it's also weird coming from Ron Howard, who his stuff is so usually wholesome. Yeah, he's he's a sexless filmmaker. I don't dislike Ron Howard. I, he's had some really fun movies, but there's no sexual stuff in a Ron Howard movie, except this. <laughs> For some reason, every movie Ron Howard ever made, the Grinch is the only one with sexual themes. So, well, Rush is surprisingly sexual as well. Oh, I've actually never seen that. So. good. Oh, you should see Rush. Yeah, Rush is actually surprisingly great. Does, does Chris Hemsworth want to have sex with the car? Is that what happened? You know? <laughs> <laughs> He's really turned on by the car. Um, so what else? What else did I watch? Uh, so uh, as promised, I, I burned through the, the original Lord of the Rings extended trilogy, which is my tradition. I watch that every year around Thanksgiving time. I won't waste more time talking about that. Just that those movies are magical and they feel so real and lived in and i'm amazed that the same filmmaker made those and then the hobbit movies which are set in the same world and just awful and i, I really would like to figure out what went wrong and how he screwed that up so badly but that's that's a conversation for another time uh <laughs> the so the mystery science Theater 3000 came out the, the new episodes uh i only watched one which is the, the mac and me episode and that is uh, very funny, uh, as, as to be expected. Mac and Me, of course, is the the E.T. ripoff where an alien comes to Earth and he loves McDonald's food, and it's so bad. And um, <laughs> Mr. Science Theater really, really tear it apart, and they do a, a pretty good job. Uh, and lastly, uh, my wife and I, we had been watching ER on Hulu, uh, much like Jacob and his wife. And we're at the point now where we're in the very – late seasons which are just awful and uh, i just got tired of it so i said let's let's try and wait to pd blue because that's another you know classic 90s show that i had just never actually watched 
in its initial run. So we started watching that. We're almost done the first season. And that's a, a surprisingly good show. That that show really holds up. It's also it's also one of those one of the first network shows that realized it could push the envelope. So like every single episode you see someone's ass. It's like you can realize like you realize as <laughs> you're like we, we can get away with this now. So there's literally just a bare ass in every single episode. <laughs> like there's a scene where David Caruso is talking to Dennis Ron in the locker room and he just strolls by and he's completely nude for no reason. He's just, just nude and his ass is hanging out. And it's just like, all right, this is a bit much, but <laughs> it, it, it lives up to its reputation. And if you're in the mood for some nineties asses, you should check out NYPD blue streaming on Hulu. Very cool. And Ben, you also rewatched some of Lord of the Rings over the weekend, right? Yes, my wife and I just uh, rewatched The Fellowship of the Ring, and that's my favorite one of the tril- the original trilogy. I'm not even going to talk about The Hobbit. But, uh, wait, wait, I... did you watch the extended cut, the cut or the Actually, theatrical? we have the extended cut on Blu-ray, and we thought about watching that, but it was like 9 p.m., uh, when we started and we were like, you know what? The extended cut isn't like almost an extra hour and that'll put us to bed at like 1 a.m. or something. And we we're like, ah, I'm, I'm, I think we're just going to stream the theatrical cut from Netflix, even though we actually own. Uh, I think we we own the DVD of the theatrical cut. Uh, but, you know, the streaming on Netflix gives us a better better viewing experience there. So um, we just watched the theatrical version on Netflix and um yeah, really quickly. I just, I mean, obviously everybody knows this movie. It's, it's uh, one of the best fantasy films ever made. And I just wanted to echo really quickly what uh, what Chris just said about how lived in it feels. I was, I was, you know, this is probably my fifteenth, twentieth time watching this movie or something, and I was just combing the background of every frame, looking for things that I'd never really seen before. And there is near the end of this movie when they uh when the characters are sort of on the shore of this river there is a stone formation that has a few steps leading up to it and it's been broken off and it's sort of like pointing toward the river and i never really noticed that before even though there are several dialogue bits that happen right around it i've always just been paying attention to the actors or uh, some other aspect of it and I, i really just sort of zeroed in on this piece of production design and it's so evocative, just the way that it's it's broken and shattered and left there on the shore. It's like what used to be there. And the entire movie is like that. There's so many things in the design of the of this world that uh, that make you wonder um, in, in really sort of a, like a, a pure way. You know, it's, it's like that Spielbergian wonder of like what what happened in this universe um, you know, what were these societies like long before in this, you know, in these eras long past? It's um, it's really beautiful, the the way that the whole thing comes together. And that's just like, again, I've seen the movie so many times and never really noticed that little aspect of it in that scene. And I'm sure there are many others that I haven't picked up on yet, but I look forward to uh, revisiting it many more times and hopefully stumbling across things like that in the future. Yeah, just goes to show, you know, what kind of impact great production design can have on you know the feeling of a story uh th- those movies have it in spades um let's move on to brad uh aside from creed 2 uh y- you also you finally saw fantastic beast 2 uh which is uh you know you were i think the lone person on the staff that that could i can complain about this movie with brad please tell me you did not like this movie <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I did not like this movie. I was I was increasingly frustrated as the movie went on because I had no idea what the hell was going on. <laughs> the, the, the story makes no sense whatsoever. Uh, like there were just several times where I'm just I, I'm waiting and I'm like I'm like I don't even know what this scene's trying to do. Like what are you trying to accomplish? There's if someone asked me to tell them what happens in Fantastic Beasts: The Crimes of Grindelwald, I couldn't accurately explain it to you. Uh, I, I don't understand how certain magic spells work. Uh, I, I don't understand. And this isn't a spoiler. I don't understand the, like the 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 logic behind how Grindelwald escaped from prison. I especially don't understand what the hell is happening in the climax of this movie uh, with Grindelwald. Um, it, it's it's just nuts. And then further furthering my frustration is one of the dumbest reveals twists <laughs> that has happened in any franchise that I've ever loved. It, it infuriates me uh, to no end. I just I, I can't wait for HT to see this movie because I I want to have like a spoiler discussion. I'm like I feel yeah. I, I'm so I'm so mad. I just I <laughs> I didn't like this movie at all. 
I, I do want to point uh, people that don't want to wait for our spoiler discussion to actually happen uh, to a video by Jenny Nicholson, who is a YouTube critic. And she did a great video called 15 Dumb Things in Fantastic Beasts 2, which actually can be watched uh, if you don't want to see the movie. And it, like, it's kind of it just points out how dumb the, the movie is. Like, it's like half an hour long and it perfectly encapsulates all my problems with the movie. And I, I highly recommend it. It's, it's, it's worth watching. I will link it in the show notes. Uh, Brad, what, what else have you been watching? Uh, so then on the complete opposite of the spectrum, I saw, can you for- ever forgive me? Uh, the Melissa McCarthy movie where she plays author Lee Israel, who was pretty down on her luck, wasn't really getting any book deals or anything, and so she decided to start writing forged uh, letters from famous writers um, and celebrities and selling them to uh, high, high-end memorabilia collectors. Um, and it's a, it's a very bleak, kind of depressing movie, but uh, Melissa McCarthy's fantastic in it. Richard E. Grant is also uh, wonderful in it. Um, it's, it's a very good movie. Uh, and I, it was a, kind of a nice break from all the rest of the, the blockbuster noise out there during Thanksgiving. Um, and I, I definitely recommend going out of your way to see it. It's a, it's a great story. It's based on a book too. So if you're interested, check out the book. Uh, it's the same title and yeah, I, I really enjoyed this one. Very cool. And, uh, you've been watching some TV as well. Yeah. So my, uh, my girlfriend's really into, uh, food and cooking shows on Netflix and whatnot. We, when we've watched some episodes of chef's table, and her brother had recently been talking about the new series, The Final Table, which takes a lot of the people, uh, cooks and stuff that appear on Chef's Table and basically puts them in a game show setting, kind of like Iron Chef, where it gives them uh, a certain country of origin and their food of specialty, and they have to bring their own uh, flair to it. They're, they're teamed up with another chef, uh, and they have to try and impress these three judges. Um, it's, it's pretty fun. Uh, I'm, I'm not super into food and cooking shows, but I, I, I am fascinated by, you know, just how they cook and these different, you know, uh, recipes they come up with and that kind of thing. And so it, it's interesting to watch. It's, I feel like it's a little too game showy. It kind of takes the, the wonder, um, and like fascination that I have with a show like chef's table out of it and makes it a little bit more, too faux dramatic, you know, just like any other reality competition show. Um, but Jacob, you watched this recently too. What, what's your take on it? Yeah, I watched the first four episodes uh, for want of anything better to do when I finally got home and didn't want to watch anything that acquired my full attention. And, uh, man, I did not like this show. It has the production value of, you know, um, another Netflix competition show, Ultimate Beastmaster. It looks great. It's trying to uh, take a proven concept, a culinary cooking show, and add that similar level of gloss and production value. But there's 24 contestants, and the show does such a poor job of telling them – of of making them characters, telling us why we should care about them. I mean, we watch Top Chef, Great British Baking Show, um, all the other t- cooking shows. The editors find amazing opportunities to paint people in broad strokes. Say, this person is is defined by this. Here's what they mean. Here's why they matter. Here's why you care. And this show, for all its production value, does not have that. It's just a bunch of shots of people making food. We don't care about these people making the food and they don't do ever good, ever a good job of actually explaining why this food matters, why the culinary styles are different from episode to episode. It is just an incredibly bland unseasoned experience of so pardon all those puns. It is just, <laughs> um, it, it bummed me out <laughs> because it looks so good, but, uh, it never once has any uh, one tenth of the emotional connection that you'll find in an episode of chopped, which is, you know, <laughs> food networks go to culinary cooking show. So yeah, I'll not be watching more of this show. Crazy. Uh, okay. Well, fantastic piece, the crimes of Grindelwald and can you ever forgive me or in theaters now in the final table you can find on Netflix, but doesn't sound like you want to, uh, Jacob, what have you been watching? I watched very little I, uh, during the break. I finished season four of Channel Zero, uh, which is really fantastic. It starts off being the scariest season of the show and ends up being the weirdest. It really feels like a Stephen King novel more than any other series uh, um, out there. More, more so than Castle Rock, Channel, Channel 4 Season Zero feels like a unmade Stephen King adaptation. Uh, it really follows those beats in a way that I found really, really admirable and fun. But um, my big thing, my big rewatch over the break was that while in Dallas, with eight people in the room arguing over what to watch, everybody has different opinions, whether it should be a TV show or a movie, my wife just screams, let's put on what to watch Thor Ragnarok. <laughs> we put on Thor Ragnarok, and for two hours, everyone is entertained. Um, my in-laws, or her 
sort of um, film her fil- filmmaker brothers who have very high fluid opinions, her sister and her sister's husband who have you know very nerdy credentials. Um, of course, me and my wife. Just every single person in that room was is happy to be watching Thor Ragnarok and watching it again maybe the fourth or fifth time at this point. That movie's so eager to please and eager to please everyone, <laughs> but it pleases well. Like it finds the right. Itch, itch to scratch or button to push for anybody in the audience, whether like the goofy comedy or the big superhero action, Taika Waititi pulls it all off. And this watching that movie silence an entire room of di- different people and bring them together was actually really kind of magical. Uh, but yeah, that's it. No other movies for Jacob. Just lots and lots of um, family vacation time. And is Thor Ragnarok on Netflix, I assume? Yeah, it's streaming on there right now. Very cool. Okay, HT, what have you been watching? So I only saw one movie in the theater this weekend, and that was At Eternity's Gate, which is the uh, film chronicling the final years of Vincent Van Gogh, um, played by Willem Dafoe. I hadn't heard a lot about this movie other than uh, praise for Willem Dafoe's performance. And uh, from what I'd seen, of like trailers or images, it looks kind of muted because it's shot in mostly natural lighting. But And I was wondering whether I, that would be able to capture sort of like the brilliant artistry of Vincent Van Gogh and how he like displays color and everything. And I'm also like a little biased because I absolutely love the Doctor Who episode of about Vincent Van Gogh. And I think that's one of the best depictions of the artist. But at Eternity's Gate is I the best um the p- depiction of the artist and like his tortured existence, but as as well as the way that he uniquely views the world so the natural lighting was it's actually a really beautiful way of depicting his particularly singular way of um viewing the world because it's it somehow becomes this rich symphony of colors by uh using the sunlight as a more as another form of color i can't really describe it but it's just beautifully shot the the cinematography Cinematography is amazing, and um, director uh, Julian Schnabel just does a, I think it's Schnabel, Schnabel, does a brilliant <laughs> job of uh, just kind of evo- evoking all these different types of colors and shades out of just like blades of grass. And yes, Willem Dafoe is astonishing in this movie, um, especially because this film, a lot of it takes place in intense close-ups of his face, and he is just all craggles and... Um, and um, just deep, deep wells of emotion. And I hope that he might get some um, uh, awards buzz for this film, especially after he got rudely snubbed for the Florida Project, which I'm still very bitter about. Um, But he's brilliant again. And I highly recommend this film, especially if you like Vincent Van Gogh or if you just want to see a film that really, that realizes um, an artist in a beautiful way. Cool, what else have you been watching? Um, so I saw the first episode of My Brilliant Friend, which is an Italian HBO miniseries. It's based off of the novel of the same name by Elena Ferrante. And it's really good so far. It's The first episode is uh, very much a period drama. It takes place in the um, 19, I think, like 60s uh, Naples. And it's this sprawling uh, story about these two uh, girls growing up in this small sort of town in uh, in Italy and uh, their kind of tumultuous friendship, uh, both of which these both of these girls are uh, incredibly smart and, per- and perceptive, one of which is kind of a, a genius, but a very um, sort of uh, um, a chaotic person. Uh, so she is um, and their friendship is really interesting and I've only seen the first episode so I can't really say much about it but I'm really enjoying it so far and it's gotten a lot of rave reviews so I'm excited to see more. I think only three episodes are out now on HBO um, and you can watch it on HBO Go. Um, and the next ep- and next thing I watched is something that I watched twice and it's the trashiest thing that I've seen this weekend but it's something that I enjoyed entirely and that's Netflix's <laughs> new Christmas offering the princess switch um it's a truly not good movie starring vanessa hudgens uh in double roles as one a baker uh from chicago with kind of no personality and then a princess from the fictional country of montanaro uh who also has no personality except for having a vaguely british accent and uh they switch places and it's all shenanigans and there's a prince and uh, a very hot 
faker as well. Um, it's <laughs> Vice actually described it um, perfectly as saying the Netflix algorithm wrote the Princess Switch, but it's amazing still, and it is so fun. It's basically the Parent Trap meets Princess Diaries, um, <laughs> meets that Meghan Markle Lifetime movie, which yes, I also watched and thoroughly enjoyed as well. So if you want to watch something that's super sweet and just well, sickeningly sweet almost and just want to see Vanessa Hudgens have it all because she can <laughs> and she has two people, I highly recommend The Princess Switch. It's fun, it's silly, and it's better than last year's Netflix um, hit um, Christmas movie, The Christmas Prince, A Christmas Prince, one of which there's a prince in there. <laughs> This year they have a bunch. They have Christmas Chronicles. No one's watched that mm-hmm. yet, right here. I'm surprised Chris hasn't watched that yet. It's in my queue. I just did not have a chance to watch uh, <laughs> Sexy Daddy Kurt Russell as Santa. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Well, uh, at Eternity's Gate is in limited release. My brilliant friend on HBO and The Princess Switch you can watch on Netflix. Uh, let's move on to what we've been reading. Uh, Jacob, you haven't been watching a lot, but you have been reading. Uh, I've been reading in the sense that I'm still making my way through uh, Blood, Sweat, and Pixels, which I talked about last week. It's very good. Um, but I haven't had a chance to actually sit down and like really concentrate on any novels. But this weekend, I was picking through um, Transmetropolitan, a uh, Vertigo comic series that ran from 97 to 2002. And it recently released the uh, third and final edition of the Absolute version of the book. And for those who don't know, um, DC and Vertigo sometimes releases, re-releases their more popular and famous series in a version called Absolute, which is very massive, oversized hardcovers and slipcases. And they're meant to better showcase the art and act as the definitive edition of those books to own. And I want to revisit Transmetropolitan because not only is the third edition now out, but because it's one of the favorite comics of all time. And because I don't, I feel like it's very prophetic. I feel like in late in the late 90s when the comic was running, we all had a different vision of what the future would look like and how, you know, 20, 2018 would feel and this series I think captures how the future is starting to feel better than anything I've ever read and it's haunting and terrifying. The series is very crude, often very silly and some parts of it haven't aged well but uh, what writer Warren Ellis and artist Derek Robertson cook up here is a version of the future where it's uh, the world is very crowded, very political um, there is Everything is incredibly advanced. People can up- upload their consciousness into computers and, and live as programs. People can um, get cybernetic implants. There's VR. There's all the stuff you expect in, in this, but everything is also incredibly stupid. Pop culture is degraded. Um, politics is just a game between a game run between fascists and between idiots. And and the main character is a um, is a is a political journalist who essentially has to arm himself and be an action hero to go out in the streets or to, to do his job. And it's um. It is dark and it's funny and it's halfway between Blade, Ro- Blade Runner and Idiocracy. And it kind of exists in that weird point where the future is this dire dystopia and everything's stupid. And is, <laughs> and I feel like I'm, I'm, I'm so disappointed that the world has become transmetropolitan when I wanted to be Star Trek. But you know, but see, yeah. reading it, reading it again, makes you realize just how eerie it is that they that they nailed this version of the future it feels so accurate and icky and terrible. But it, it's an amazing comic. And like I said, get over some of the nineties stuff. It, it kind of makes you feel a little like, yeah, yeah. Nineties were all rad and cool. Yeah, I get it. <laughs> uh, but cause it's so smart. And the, um, without saying too much, there are two presidents tracked in this fictional universe that the uh, main character, the wonderfully named spider Jerusalem has to, uh, take down one of whom is just a die in the wool proud of it fascist and the other one is a guy with no political agenda whatsoever other than the fact that he wants power to hurt people and both are the kind of politicians we see way too often on the world stage these days so seeing them get taken down by this this uh incredibly crude armed and dangerous journalist is incredibly satisfying very cool I, i've been meaning to revisit watchmen you know, with the, the the new series coming out, uh, and I'm not not a huge fan of Watchmen. Uh, you know, I love the ideas of that book, uh, but the art just keeps me away. Every time I pick it up, I'm just I don't know. I I have read through it, but I, I want to revisit it. I feel like you have just sold me on instead of <laughs> rereading Watchmen, uh, checking this out, which I've never I've never uh, read before. So yeah, I'd be very curious to hear what you want to say. I know the, uh, they've been trying to make into a TV show off and on for years. I know Patrick Stewart was interested in starring in it years ago. Tim Roth was attached years ago. And I think the time is right. If they're going to do it, now's the time. 
Very cool. Let's move on to what we've been eating. I mentioned before I had a Friendsgiving. Uh, ben was there. And uh, speaking of Ben, him and uh, his wife Amy, uh, well, first of all, we, we you know we had all the typical stuff. We had you know turkey, mashed potatoes, corn, stuffing. Uh, but Ben and Amy brought uh, some very interesting things. We talked about chacaroni and cheese last week uh and that was a hit uh Kitra loved it it was a little too cheesy for me but i think that's the point right then <laughs> yeah pretty much yeah it's got like almost three pounds of cheese in it so yeah. yes yeah uh but w- the, the surprise hit of the uh, of the day was uh they brought over this thing called pumpkin pie dip which is a dip that you dip graham crackers into and it was incredible i think everybody loved that and also the um they also brought caramel apple sangria, uh, which was dangerous because it didn't taste like alcohol at all. But, um, uh, yeah, so th- they brought some great stuff to the Friendsgiving. Uh, I have been off my diet for the last week, and because of that, I've gained uh, more weight than I care to admit. But uh, I-, I-, I used that opportunity because I mentioned last week I went to uh, Disneyland to uh, test, a, uh, you know, try out their Festival of Holidays offerings, and uh, I used that opportunity uh, this weekend to go to Halloween Rays, and I waited three hours in line because that's what you do at Halloween Rays. This is a Nashville fried chicken restaurant uh, that is in Chinatown in Los Angeles. Uh, ben has mentioned it in the past on the podcast, I believe, and it, it is uh, it probably is perhaps not worth waiting three hours in line. But uh, it is fantastic, and I've I've been craving it ever since starting this diet a couple months back. So uh, that, I got my fix for uh, you know the next couple months until uh, you know I can I can binge again. Um, but... What time did you go? Because when I went, it was in the morning, and I had to wait probably about that long. Um, did you go in the evening? <sighs> We went later. I think we got there at like 3 p.m. and we were eating our food. Oh, man, and the line was still that long? Yeah, I think it was actually worse than normal because it was Thanksgiving weekend. And I think a lot of people that like have, you know, family or friends coming into L.A. are like, you know, this is one of those places that you take them to. So I think it was – well, I'll, I'll, it sounds like you had the same, similar experience. But usually my experience on a Saturday is usually like an hour and a half or two hours. Um, but yeah, it, it was it was pretty crazy. But they now have um, they now have chicken tenders. So if you go back and try the chicken oh. tenders, um, I highly recommend Halloween Rays. Uh, although you know it is it is a long wait. Uh, it's probably I've never been there on the weekdays. I'm sure it's it's much smaller on the weekdays. And they are opening a second location. I think they announced in Pasadena, which is not close to me or you. So that helps us not too much. <laughs> but but maybe perhaps when that opens, the line there will be shorter in driving to Pasadena, uh, you know, in the whole calculated time of things right. will be much less. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> that which is crazy. Um, Jacob, wh- wh- what did you do on Thanksgiving? I had two Thanksgiving dinners. <laughs> I went with my family whose uh, origins are very much uh, New England, a very New England style uh, Thanksgiving dinner, turkey, you know, dressing, all of the very ordinary, traditional, um, what you expect from a postcard Thanksgiving type meal. And in Dallas, I had dinner with my fa- with my wife's Italian slash Cajun family. So it was a interesting blend of traditional stuff, plus gumbo, plus spicy rice dressing, Plus all kinds of really delicious nonsense that I have that, is, that to me is not Thanksgiving food, but hey, whatever. <laughs> here it is. It's it's their Thanksgiving food. See, see, my, uh, my my family is mostly Italian. So uh, when I was a kid, it was a combination of the traditional American Thanksgiving and like pasta and ravioli. And I I didn't know until maybe my teenage years that that wasn't the normal Thanksgiving. That you know, that, that pasta and ravioli was not included in that mix. Uh, and I also I googled um, best peanut butter pie and made that recipe but then had to leave my first Thanksgiving before it could be eaten so I was told it was very good so if you ever want to make a good pie for your family google best pie very cool Um, Brad what did you do what did you eat over the weekend Uh, so I already talked about my Thanksgiving meal because it was different it was part of earlier Um, and that's also because there are some other things that I want to talk about in this section um, so my girlfriend, uh, Brittany, introduced me to this thing that you do called a Tim Tam Slam. Um, first of all, do you guys know what Tim Tams are, right? Yeah, they're amazing cookies. They're delicious. Yeah. Everybody should eat them. 
Yeah, yeah, there's the incredible cookie. They're very popular uh, across the pond, and they're they're really you can find them here in stores pretty easily now. They're they're delicious. They're chocolate covered cookies or biscuits, as the British say. They have varying flavors, but like the best one is for is the milk chocolate one. And she introduced me to this thing that apparently people do, where it you take the Tim Tam and you bite uh, two corners off of it, two uh, caddy corners, and then you dip it into hot chocolate. And use it as a straw, and you, so you suck up some hot chocolate into the cookie, and then you put the cookie in your mouth, and like the cookie basically just completely melts in your mouth, and it is delicious and uh, life changing way to eat Tim Tams and hot chocolate, especially for for winter. It was it was so good. The cookie just immediately turns gooey and soft, and it's amazing. Wait, who invented this? I don't know who invented it, but my 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 girlfriend. Just has just like like asked me. She's like, "Wait, you never done a Tim Tam slam?" I'm like, "No, what the hell is that?" <laughs> but this is like a thing. Like if you searched it online, like people know what the Tim Tam slam is. I'm I'm looking it up right now on Google. <laughs> I'm seeing, yeah, the the Tim Tam slam is a is a, a normal thing. Apparently, it's it looks like it might have originated in Australia. Well, that would make sense because your girlfriend is from Australia, right? No, no, she's from Zimbabwe, Zimbabwe. but close. Oh, okay. <laughs> I just I'm looked. Totally I just wrong. googled it, and there's a video that says, "Here's how to do a Tim Tam slam," and it's from the Today Show in January of 2017. So this is already like not huh. cool anymore already because they're cool because the Today Show did it. <laughs> <laughs> oh boy. Um, so yeah, so that was delicious. Um, I also got my hands on some sugar cookie toast crunch, uh, which is a seasonal version of cinnamon toast crunch that is uh, flavored more like a sugar cookie than cinnamon toast. Um, and it's pretty good. Not as good as Cinnamon Toast Crunch just because that cereal is pretty much, you know, a perfect breakfast cereal. Uh, but it is it is pretty good. It's not sickeningly sweet, but it, it's still a pretty sweet cereal. Um, nice, you know, just nice change of pace on, uh, on the cereal shelf for the holidays. And then um, I had Indian food that I didn't hate. Uh, I haven't been a fan of Indian food for the longest time. And it's mostly because I think just a, a bad experience that I had in high school and I just didn't like it. Uh, and my girlfriend has been bugging me to like try it again. And she's like, she's like, I'll order something for you. She's like, I, I, I know what you like. And uh, I promise it'll be good. And so her cousin had a birthday thing. Uh, and it was at an Indian restaurant. And so we got it there. Um, and what I had was uh, chicken tikka masala, uh, which I loved. It was delicious. Um, the, the chicken and the sauce was amazing. Putting on the rice, uh, putting it on the, the naan and eating it together uh, was, was really good. I thoroughly enjoyed it i'm interested to try some more stuff and see what else i like um and so yeah it was, it was really good next time you go to indian food uh try to get peshwari naan which is like this almost dessert kind of bread like you know naan bread it's it's fantastic i i have a okay. feeling you will love it all right good to know ht what have you been eating so i ate this um pho that i made in my new instant pot that my mother gave me and uh, I was a little intimidated to make pho because it's um, this Vietnamese dish that requires quite a lot of time usually to um, to make. You have to – it's either a chicken or a beef pho, and, and with either versions, you have to kind of stew the bones for at least like three or four hours. And um, with an Instant Pot, though, that reduces the time to about half an hour, a little bit longer for beef bones because you have to get all the flavor out of the bones for that. But um, I was and I've also never used an Instant Pot before. It's something that's also kind of intimidating for me, but um, it because it, it's like a pressurized cooker. And at the end, you have to like let out the steam in a way that like they warn you like, oh, use a towel so you don't burn yourself. I'm like, OK. <laughs> <laughs> I guess I'll try, but it turned out to be pretty painless. You just put all the spices and everything into one big pot with a lot of uh, chicken bouillon and water and chicken and it's not chicken stock, just the chicken bouillon. And then like these, this bag of pho spices, uh, you carve up the chicken afterwards and um, it's delicious. And uh, I was very happy that um, my first go around was good. Um, this wasn't for Thanksgiving. This was for a meal with my family again uh, after the my cousin's baby shower and they were all impressed and so I was I was happy that it worked out because otherwise that would have been uh, not so fun to serve to my <laughs> my cousins who are have a lot who love food a lot and love Vietnamese food especially so um, it turned out well and I'm excited to I guess I'm like getting ahead of like New Year's resolutions but to try cooking more Vietnamese food especially in my instant pot and instant pots of course can do more than just Vietnamese food you can do like 
basically everything in it. I think my mom has made a few desserts even in Instant Pot. But um, I'm, yeah, excited to try to cook more things and cook more Vietnamese food. Very cool. Um, and there was quite a few Instant Pots on sale during Black Friday. I, yeah. Uh, I, t I turned them down because I was like, I, I don't know. Am I going to actually use this? I just... It's so easy, uh, Peter. It's like you throw a bunch of things in there and then like 25 minutes later, maybe even 10 minutes later, it's done. See, but it requires me looking up a recipe. Like I, like I have a sous vide, and that is so easy. But like, I just <laughs> never use it. It sits in my drawer. I don't know. Um, maybe I'll have to get one because uh, I know I, I'm, I'm on a keto diet, and I know there are some like Instant Pot uh, keto diet, you know, recipe books and stuff like that. So that might be an easy way to cook dinner. Um, let's move on to what we've been playing. Uh, I, between Friendsgiving and, uh, the next day I had a, uh, board game day. We played a bunch of games, uh, with Ben. Uh, I played this game, uh, d d during our Friendsgiving called Where Words. Uh, this is made by the people that do Ultimate Werewolf. If you've never played that game, it's basically a game where you are in a village and there is a werewolf on the loose and every night you know the werewolf kills someone in the village and uh you are trying to figure out who on who who at the table is actually the werewolf uh so it's kind of a hidden uh deduction kind of game uh the where words is basically werewolf meets uh 20 questions so basically uh one person the mayor uh knows uh, there's an app that basically suggests a word and the mayor knows the word and there is werewolves who also know the word and they're trying to throw the villagers off track if that makes sense uh it's a fun game it's a little bit harder to figure out who the werewolves are because like you don't really get a sense of like when you're getting you know pushed off track and stuff and there's a seer who also see saw the word but can't give obvious clues because if the werewolves know who the seer is, uh, the werewolf team wins. Um, so yeah, it, it, I would recommend it. It's a it's it's a good party game, but it's uh, I don't know. I don't I don't think it's as good as uh, the traditional werewolves. Uh, ben, w what did you think of the game? Yeah, I think uh, I think it, it's it, bringing the app into it kind of made things. I don't know. It's good and bad, right? Like, I, I like the traditional werewolf game as well. But this one, you know, if you get a bad category or if you get a bad word or something, it can definitely throw things off track. I mean, it, the way you described it sort of makes it sound more complicated than it is, I think. Once yeah. you actually get in there and you're you're playing it, it's, you know, if you play a practice round, everybody there is instantly going to understand what's going on. Um, but it, yeah, I don't know. I, I'm sort of torn about it. What do you think? Like the because we, we narrowed it down to movies at one point, and that was fun because you sort of had an idea of the category that you're <laughs> that you're trying to guess what this word is, and that that I and, and it's not even really a, a word. Better. Like we did movies and we put on ridiculously hard, and I think one of the entries was like a fault in our stars. Yes. <laughs> so it's like, try, you know, so basically everybody at the table is asking this one person, the mayor, you know, oh, is it a, you know, person? Is it, a, you know, asking all these questions and all they get is yes or no answers. And, you know, try to decipher a fault in their stars from that. Um, but surprise... yeah, and you only have like two minutes to narrow it down, too. So it's not like you can just sit there forever and narrow things down, you know, slowly over time. Like there's a ticking clock element to it as well. Yeah. I do think it's one of those games that if you had a regular group, it would benefit from that because then you would start to kind of sense, you know, who's kind of throwing you off track and who isn't. Yeah. Um, but it, it's it definitely for, I mean, we only played a few, maybe like five games of it. it it's very quick, uh, which is one of the things I, I that make me, makes me like this because, you know, a lot of times you bring a game to the table and it's, you know, even Cards Against Humanity in a party setting can take, you know, way too long. <laughs> Mm -hmm. um yeah so uh we played that that was fun uh the next day i had a tabletop game uh, game day and we played a bunch of games i played a, a game called hail hydra 
which is from Spin Master. Uh, they it is based on the Marvel Comics license, and it is another uh, hidden trader deduction game where you're all Marvel superheroes, but one of you is a Hydra spy, and you're going on missions to try to defeat the villains, uh, leading up to the big villain who is uh, Red Skull, and um, you can use your special powers and stuff. And, and by then, you kind of have to determine who who is the Hydra spy. Uh, you know, they, they can sabotage the missions and such. And it, it, it's a fun game. You can buy it mass market, I think, at Target and stuff. It, 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 I, I would recommend it um, if you if you want to get into those games. And, you know, I, I know Marvel as a IP is probably a lot easier to get into, get, you know, get friends into rather than like, you know, Resistance or Werewolves or any of those kind of like just generic uh, concepts. Um, we also played a game called Detective. Uh, Jacob, have you played this yet? No, but I've heard reviews that make me very curious to hear your response to it. Uh, Detective is this game from Portal Games. Portal Games makes uh, some of my favorite games of all time. They they make a game called Robinson Crusoe, or you're trapped on an island. Anyways, uh, so they make this game, Detective, which you are basically a detective. You and your friends are detectives on a case uh, that didn't happen, like a fictional case, but you were... Uh, using you have to travel around a map and find clues and uh, read a bunch of things like you can interrogate a person you can uh, search like there's a database on the computer that like you actually use to look stuff up and then you actually at times even look up information on the actual real internet uh, to try to help out the case Uh, we quit about halfway through it uh, was a lot of reading I don't think it's a good uh, huge group kind of thing. Um, it is fun because they recommend like that you have like a whiteboard so you can actually like make one of those like what do they call them like a mind map of like y- you know where you're connecting the dots between like suspects and places and the chain of custody of certain items and stuff like that. So like I, I think if you had like two people that are like really into that because it's a lot of reading. It's a lot like uh, there's another game out there called Sherlock Holmes Consulting Detective, um, which is a lot of reading. It's kind of like in that same vein. So if you like that, I would recommend this, but it, it it's just too much for a big group. And we, we kind of gave up on it, and I'm looking to sell this. So, <laughs> it's just not my, not for my group, which is kind of disappointing. It, it's a little too uh, too complicated, I think. Um, and I, I do think then uh, the inclusion of a computer in this whole uh, mess, like it, it should make things easier like when you go to uh when you go to um like interrogate a person uh you have to you know read a card but uh you know it should be like you know here's the audio from the interrogation and then you listen to it like it should make things easier and it really doesn't uh so i was kind of i was very disappointed by detective uh, and the last game we played, I don't know, I don't know why we played so many hidden trade and trader deduction games, but we did. Uh, this is a game a friend brought over called Chameleon. This is a, a mass market game you can buy at Target, and it's basically um, it's basically Spyfall meets Werewords, I guess is a good example, a good uh, analogy if you know board games. So basically, what this is is everybody at the table. Uh, gets a card that kind of um, tells you the coordinates of a word. So uh, you roll the die, and the, the die uh, by looking at the card, it tells you the coordinates of a word. And on the table, there's a set of like probably 16 words, and each card is like a different theme. So they'll be like 80s movies or whatever, right? And uh, so now everybody at the table knows what the word is. So say the word is Batman. Right. So everybody at the table knows the word is Batman, except for one person, the chameleon. And then basically you go around the table and each person has to say a word that basically gives the entire table the impression that they know what the word is out of that 16 words. But not too obvious that it gives it away to the chameleon so they can catch on and like, you know, uh, give their uh uh, their indication as well. So at the end of the round, you, you point fingers at who you think the chameleon is. This game, I think, is actually a much better version of Where Words, and uh, actually a much better version of Spyfall. And I'm shocked uh, because usually uh, from these mass market games, usually you have to get go to like a hobby store to get like a really gamery, fun game like this. This is something you can 
you know, get it at your local Target. I highly recommend Chameleon, and it's I, I think it's pretty cheap too. Yeah, it's, I think it's like fifteen or twenty bucks. It's uh, designed by Ricky Tejada, who designed Coup, another really, really great um, deception game. So even though it's at Target, it's it has the pedigree of a actual designer with with a history of making great stuff. And it's another one of those games that the round is over in like you know a few minutes. Like it's a really fast game to play. So uh, if you're looking for something like that for one of your parties, I highly recommend Chameleon. Uh, Jacob, what have you been playing? Uh, I discovered that Diablo 3 is not only the game I'm still addicted to on my, on my Switch, but it is also a great game to have out during uh, Thanksgiving events because the game is um, not quite mindless, but it's, it's it's a game you can play while distracted by other things. You can, you can have entire conversations while playing Diablo 3 on your Switch. So that's what I did for lots of Thanksgiving. There's a moment where our family members were talking about something or a conversation was happening that I was not actively involved in or maybe I was not quite bored, but... Um, Felt like I'm kind of sitting here doing nothing. I need my hands need to do something. I'd pull out and play that. And and as long as your parents or family members don't mind you having a video game in a conversation, uh, which my family did not because um, it just made everybody happier that we were all happy, uh, it's the perfect distraction game. Also, our Rogue Legacy has hit Nintendo Switch. And this is a game I played until uh, I had nothing left to do in it for PlayStation 4. It is a game where... You play as a knight who needs to invade and conquer a evil castle, and then you die very quickly. And then you play as that knight's son or daughter, and you have to invade the castle, and you die very quickly. And then you keep on playing as a descendant of this knight, who can, you can like invest money and experience points to get stronger each time. So uh, over time, you start making your runs in the castle longer and longer and longer until you eventually win. And you can like look at your family tree and see how many nights you lost doing it, and it's really fun. It's it's only fifteen bucks, I believe, on the Switch, and I like it so much that I'm playing it again on a different system after beating it years ago. So it is a very good game. Uh, but like Peter, I played a lot of tabletop over the, over the vacation because this is the best time to have your family over to play board games. And I also played Hail Hydra, the Marvel themed deduction game. And it's good. It is a it is a very very good one of these. It's a very very good. Some of the table is lying. Is someone is sabotaging the game? Uh, who is it? Uh, I think the the price point. I think it's only thirty or forty dollars, and the theme makes it very palatable for a lot of people, especially families. Because I think the best of these types of games is Secret Hitler, which is uh, from a few years ago. But the theme of trying to root out fascism in 1930s Germany is you know <laughs> kind of dark, even when the game itself is very funny. But you can play uh, Hail Hydra with kids and with families, and everybody knows who Captain America is. Everyone knows who Iron Man is. So it's a much easier get to the table. So even though I prefer other games of this genre, uh, it's well-made. It plays nicely. The art is very good. The component quality is, is okay. It's not as good as others, but for the price point you're paying for it, it is, it, it's a really solid thing. Yeah, that would be my only complaint is, like, the like the board is made out of, like, thin paper. It's, like, yeah. pretty poorly made. Yeah, but then you look at the uh, character cards and the art. I can't remember who did the art for them, but the illustrations of all the Marvel heroes and villains are fantastic, and I really, really enjoyed looking at them. Uh, I also played uh, News at 11. And I've talked in the podcast before about how I'm not a big fan of Cards Against Humanity because I like games that um, don't... Like, Cards Against Humanity, you put down your cards, and there's a joke on the table, everybody laughs, and you move on. And that for me, it's a little old. I prefer games that, like, give you the tools to make your own jokes. And last week, I talked about... Um, Someone Has Died, a game where you have to uh, try to get somebody's inheritance by making up characters based on cards in your hand. And so even though you, the card game gives you tools to make your own jokes and be funny and sort of customize it in a way that other games may not. And News at 11 is very similar. Where one player is the lead anchor and has introduced the new story of the morning, a series of stories. And everybody else is given cards. They're actually customizable. They have, they have blank spaces where you can actually write in your own key phrases. So you customize the game as you play. Everybody gets to put their personal thumbprint on it. And it'll be like, give everybody a card. And then I'll have to say, like, I'll take, I'll take okay, um, now it's the weather with so and so. And the person who is at the weather desk has to tell the weather report using the cards in their hand. And then everybody, and there's sports, there's, you know, human interest stories, whatever the, the, the lead anchor wants to use. And then all the cards are shuffled back up with some, with some new cards and dealt back out. Then we do midday news where everybody has to once again do another news story. But let's say there was a news story in the morning about how, um, Traffic is bad because a macaroni and cheese truck exploded. Because that was what the words were that they came up with. Suddenly, um, the person 
who's now on the weather desk, has the macaroni and cheese card in their hand. So now that story has that was a traffic story in the morning has now developed into a weather story. So they, they on their feet have to explain how that morning's macaroni and cheese traffic disaster is now affecting the weather. And then you do this a few more times in the evening, and the same story keeps being shuffled back in with all the new stuff. So by the evening, the macaroni and cheese story has evolved again to a different desk, and now maybe it is a human interest story. So it went from being traffic is bad because the macaroni and cheese truck exploded, to the weather is bad because macaroni and cheese fumes are keep people inside, to um, the guy who owned the macaroni and cheese truck has lost his job in the evening, and here's why he's sad. So it is really, really funny. Um, I see how people on their toes have to evolve and make up jokes and react. And even when they're not funny, it's still funny because you were watching them struggle trying to <laughs> imp- improv uh, their way out of these impossible scenarios. So that's uh, News at 11. It's very fun. Um, I'll play the Zool, which I've talked about on the show before. It is a game about building a mosaic tile <laughs> layout, which sounds so boring. Uh, but my mom loves it. My sister loves it. My, my brother-in-law loves it. My wife loves it. And it's just a 30-minute long game of trying to get the right tiles in the right order before everybody else does. And that seems very simple, and it is, but it, is, it may be the best game I've played in 2018. It is remarkably entertaining and so good. And finally, I played Arboretum, a card game that has a bear to teach. Like I, I have pity on anybody who tries to learn this game without having board game experience. But once, you, once it clicks, it is incredibly fun and simple. It just is everybody stared at me slack-jawed as I was trying to explain how it works. And halfway through the first game, which is only 30 minutes long, everyone went, oh, I get it. <laughs> um, Arboretum is a game of trying to use the cards in your hand to build an attractive Arboretum of trees. You want to have uh, right the diversity of different types of trees. You want to try to put them in the right order. They're all numbered. You get, you get scored for having long rows of trees, scored for having long rows of the same trees. And the uh, little twisted mechanic is that uh, you have to keep some tree cards in your hand because let's say you play a bunch of cards, a bunch of maple cards onto the table. If somebody has more maple cards in their hand than you do, even if they have zero maple cards in the table, they have the obligation to score their maple uh, cards and not you. So if somebody else, so it's really, really kind of a devious game in that you have to manage the table but also manage your hand. And you can sabotage somebody just by holding on to cards you never have never any intention of using. But it's very fast, very fun. Just be patient with it because it is hard to really understand it at first. Uh, and finally, this is a section we also talk about music sometimes. Uh, being stuck in a car with family members for multiple hours and searching for new Christmas music, I discovered uh, that Twisted Sister, the 80s band, 80s hair metal band, recorded a Christmas album in 2005. And it is the worst thing I've ever heard. But I was in charge of DJ music for the car. So we listened to all of Twisted Sisters Christmas album. And it is it is something else. I recommend everybody find some time to torture your head with it this holiday season. Where can you listen to that? <laughs> it's available on iTunes. That's... I pay I pay for the uh, uh, Apple Music um, program, 15 bucks a month. So I just dropped it on my playlist and I now have it forever as long as I keep paying my money. <laughs> uh, I'm not sure if that's a good thing or not. No, oh, it is, it's the best thing, Peter. How could you not want to listen to Twisted Sister Christmas at all times? <laughs> okay, that we have reached the end <laughs> of this episode of Slash Film Daily. Jacob, where can we find more of your work online? I'm on SlashFilm.com every single day, and I'm on Twitter where I'm at Jacob S. Hall. Brad, where are you? On Twitter at Ethan underscore Anderton, and of course, always on SlashFilm.com, and with my own podcast, Go Flix Yourself on iTunes. Ben, where can we find you? Uh, I am at SlashFilm.com as well. You can find me on Twitter and Instagram at Ben Pears. HT, where do you write stuff? Oh, it's SlashFilm.com. And you can find me on Twitter at HTranBooey. Chris, if I wanted to find you on social media, where can I do that? Uh, you can go on Twitter at Evangelista 413 Please do. <laughs> and you can find me at slash film on all social media you can uh find some of the, the things i mentioned like Shaq, Shaq's macaroni and cheese and uh jenny nicholson's 15 dumb things and fantastic beasts linked in the show notes uh this podcast slash film daily is published every weekday on slash film.com and itunes google play overcast spotify all the popular podcast apps please feel free to send us your feedback questions comments concerns to us at peter at slash film.com and please go to our itunes page Write us a five-star review. Tell everybody what, why you like this podcast. And spread the word. Tell your friends. And we will be back tomorrow. Hey, hey Peter. Do you know what time it is? 
<laughs> you, you, oh, Lordy. <laughs> <laughs> You're back home, so you have the book, don't you? I have the gargantuan book of insult, offense, and effrontery by Louis A. Safian. And I've opened up to a random page, as is our tradition here on Slash Film Daily Podcast, for some great truths that this book speaks about all of us. <laughs> All right, I hope to, to a section... I, I, I don't think I've found one truth <laughs> from this book. <laughs> I, I, I have opened up to a section called Cream Puffs, which seems like an outdated term for someone who's weak. Oh, wow. Oh, I thought I was the food. I was very excited for a second. <laughs> well, HT, we, you can, we can break you easier than a biscuit. Oh. <laughs> I mean, that's probably true. <laughs> hey, uh, hey, hey, Ben... You'd commit yeah. suicide if you could do it without killing yourself. Wow, this is These a are really, dark. really mean section, the cream puff section. Who knew? I, I am a cream puff, apparently. <laughs> <laughs> hey, Chris, on the way home to the airport, you buy insurance for your limousine ride. That's true, because I'm terrified of everything. Yeah. <laughs> uh... <laughs> Hey, hey, Brad, you're a man of firm convictions. They manifest as soon as you know what everyone else thinks about it. Yeah, that's true. Yeah. <laughs> uh, hey, Peter, uh, your big trouble is that you never knows and owes your own mind. Uh, Wait, no. I, uh, <laughs> Jake, Jacob, I, I, <laughs> I, I eat cream puffs like you for breakfast. What? <laughs> Why did this category start off so mean and then get like <laughs> <laughs> ah your nose like it started off like suicide and then ended with this. well I guess we're all as jumpy and fidgety as a long tailed as a long tailed cat in a room full of rocking chairs take that and we're all more nervous than a turkey in November take that hey, and we're such green, we're such green puffs we even say thank you when an automatic door opens for us I do actually. <laughs> Is cream puff really like a word that people use to? It is. Apparently, it means a cow, a cowardly, polite person oh. who who is prone to anxiety, according to these various accurate insults. <laughs> hmm. Wow. Yeah, I guess uh, searching Google, it says uh, <laughs> the second definition for cream puff is a weak or infectual person. Well, that, is, that describes everyone at slash them.com. Yes. I'm glad we've all learned something today.